Please be aware, in this podcast series, we talk about all areas of safeguarding, which some people may find upsetting. So please make sure you're okay listening to today's topic. Be mindful of those around you, such as children, that you might not want to listen in. Hi, I'm SSS Safeguarding Director Sam Preston. And I'm former head teacher and content author Sarah Spinks. Today we're talking about domestic abuse. Now, I know we do play an advisory health warning prior to uh, the start of this podcast, but I do just want to say today we'll be discussing things and examples which some people may find upsetting, so do take care and be aware of that. So just to set some context, Um, The Crime Survey for England and Wales in 2022, that data shows um, that in the year ending March 2022, there was a 7.7% increase in domestic violence related crimes across England and Wales, with approximately 156,000 domestic violence incidents recorded by the police. The survey estimates that 2.4 million people will have experienced domestic abuse in the last year. One in seven men and one in four women will be a victim of domestic abuse in their lifetime. Of the domestic abuse crimes recorded by the police, 25% were committed against men. So first of all, Sarah, let's address um, probably the most noticeable thing we've seen over the the last few years. We now use the term domestic abuse, which has replaced the term domestic violence. Uh, Can you give us an outline of the the rationale for this? Yeah, I think domestic violence always gave the connotation of it having to be a violent act whereas domestic abuse now it encompasses the variety of forms of controlling bullying threatening or violent behavior and i think now it's really important that we are are fully aware that domestic abuse has got an awful lot of different factors to it and it can occur amongst adult family members um, and has the potential to inflict serious harm on children and young individuals. So that's why it's also constituted as child abuse as well. And it can encompass many different aspects. So it can happen both within or outside of a family's home. Uh, it can actually even manifest itself through things like the telephone or the internet or social media platforms. It sort of persists in a variety of relationships as well and can persist even after a relationship has ended. And as you said in your introduction, Sam, it can affect both men and women as victims and or perpetrators. So it can manifest itself in emotional, physical, sexual, economic, coercive or psychological forms, which can include physical violence, um, sexual assault, The controlling of someone's finances, you know, by withholding money or hindering their earning capacity. It also encompasses controlling behaviours now, like dictating where someone can go or what they can wear or restricting someone's ability to leave their own home even. Or as well as invading privacy, you know, by reading emails or text messages or letters and making threats of harm or even death uh, to the victim or their family members. And they all constitute domestic abuse it's not just that traditional held view that you had to be physically hit to be a victim so it's a much wider ramification these days so given that um perhaps the 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 sort of less obvious to the outside world forms you know i'm thinking about sort of the coercive control for example um aspect it can actually be really challenging to identify this kind of abuse. And I mean, abusers often alter their behaviour in the presence of others and um, children um, because they're either frightened or maybe confused. That can lead them to keep um, the abuse concealed. And we know um, that these adverse childhood experiences can lead to real long-term consequences for these for these children. 
Absolutely. The consequences of living with domestic uh, abuse for a child is is far reaching. And as you mentioned, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, as we call them now, are it's well documented that domestic abuse that is encountered by a child uh, is going to have potential ramifications for the rest of their lives. Um, it can affect their mental and physical well-being as well as their behaviour. And they can persist even beyond when a relationship between the adults has ended. Post-separation abuse and coercive control can continue to sort of influence a child's life um, well into adulthood. And it's crucial, you know, to ensure that abuse ceases and that children, you know, have that safe and stable environment in which to grow. Um, I, I had an experience recently, actually, Sam, which I, I'll share with you. Um, I met a mother of a... Um, of who who was a mother of a child, children at my school, and she was telling me a tale about how she'd not gone to secondary school. Uh, she'd left primary school and she wasn't allowed to go to secondary school. And I was shocked at that because she's only 38, this mother. This isn't long ago. But one of the things she was telling me was that her mother, in fact, since she got married to her father, was never allowed to leave the home. Everything was brought to the mother. And the only time she ever left that home was to go to the doctor's. And even that... The doctor's was in a house where the front room was the surgery and the back room was the waiting room. And when her mother went to the doctor's, her father refused to let her sit in the waiting room. and She had to sit on the stairs of the house until her turn to go into the surgery. So and that's modern. That's these days. And that was never picked up. And that was shocking that that abuse was happening in relatively 20, only 20 years ago, you know. Um, so that's an example of where coercive control can really damage the life chances. And this mother's absolutely determined that her children now will have all the full benefit that we can offer with schools and et cetera going forward. So it was shock. And I think it's important uh one of the, the the real imp sort of important changes that's been incorporated into all the the, the key legislation, um, children are now recognised as actual victims, not passive victims of domestic abuse, but actual victims of domestic abuse if they have been living in the home and they've witnessed it. And and you know it's not a direct. Sorry, we're going to have to stop. Can you hear these bonging? Right, so um, let's stop and let's we can go stop. back and so then we if, can restart on yeah, recognising so children. If we go back to, it was fine up until the end of your piece, but when I came in to talk about the legislation, so we'll start from there when I talk about yeah. legislation. Okay, so let's carry on. Okay. And I think it's it's important to um, recognise that it's only just been fairly recently that legislation has changed. I mean, we now uh, recognise children as actual victims of domestic abuse, not passive victims of domestic abuse. And um, and that's that to me is, is is really really important because that places the focus on. Uh, children as a victim and not just um, some, you know, somebody in the periphery of this. Um, so it places that importance for practitioners to ask the question: um, What can we do um, to, you know, to to support these children and try and minimise through our trauma informed practice those adverse child experience, those aces that you mentioned, Sarah. So working with children in, um, for example, in schools, what steps can we take to be um, what I like to call domestic abuse aware? Yeah, well, it's interesting, actually, because we need to recognise the signs. That's a really key thing. So mm. we need to be aware of the signs of domestic abuse, uh, you know, and that can include sort of changes in students' behaviour or physical injuries or frequent absences, uh, emotional distress. 
And I think practitioners must trust their instincts. If something seems wrong, the likelihood something is wrong. And it is about being really aware and, and delving into that. Another key bit really is always maintain that confidentiality. You know, if, if a child confides in you about domestic abuse, assure them that you'll keep their information confidential unless there is an immediate risk to their safety. So we have to encourage them to share that with a trusted adult, uh, such as a teacher or a social worker. And of course, your usual safeguarding processes follow that, where you share those concerns with your DSL or, or with, with another colleague and follow those safeguarding processes. I think to safeguard children in those awful situations, we've got to report that suspected abuse. Um, you know, in many cases, um, as educators, it's mandatory reporting, really. Uh, we you know we are legally obliged to report suspected child abuse, and we need to make sure that any child who's suspected of being abused or being in a home where abuse is taking place, um, we need to make sure that we follow our school's protocol. And I think just picking up on that, that's one of um, it's one of the things that uh, we really do need to be thinking of the impact on the child, because I know and certainly, you know, from from my practice and, you know, which goes way back um you you might be aware that um, there was something not quite right between the relationship uh, between you know the the, the parents and, and a family. It didn't necessarily um, prompt people to think, "What's the child experiencing here? How is that impacting on the child?" Um, so it's really really important, I think, that if you know. Um, or you suspect that there is there is something not quite right within the family unit that you always think child, even if what's presenting doesn't necessarily immediately impact and 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 sort of direct you to think there's something happening with the child. Absolutely, yeah. Child at the centre of everything that we ever do. And yeah. that brings me on to sort of that whole idea of listening and offering support to that child. You know, we need to always be a supportive and non-judgmental listener when we're dealing with children. We need to let that child know that you believe them and you're there to help yeah. Yeah. and encouraging them to talk about their feelings and concerns. And I think, you know, we need to make sure that we connect with our DSL and and we use the resources that are at our disposal in schools. And they are there to provide guidance and resource and sort of intervention strategies that we could put in place. And there are professionals that are trained to handle such issues, you know, as domestic abuse and offer assistance to that child and their family. And whilst we can feel reticent at first to be, we don't want to upset the families and we don't want to be, uh, you know, making sure that child, as you say, Sam, is at the centre of that. So we have to act in accordance with that. And that's one of those situations, isn't it? I mean, I know we've spoken about this before, about the the careful conversations and the difficult conversations, because when you are working in, in an educational setting, especially, I would say, in the early years and primary years, you have um, a, a, a lot of the work that you put in um, to that the, the 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 sort of relationship building is establishing that relationship with the with them whoever has parental responsibility it's a very big part of the child's education at that stage so there there is a um you know there is a difficulty in maintaining that relationship where you are having difficult conversations and i think this is this is this is prop you know a really good example of that where um you often get, I mean, I know I've had this where um, a parent might have shared something related to domestic abuse with me. They take no further action. And then the relationship is, is slightly different because that confidence has been shared um, and it, it almost is factored into the, into the relationship and you've got to work very hard um, much as it can be frustrating as a practitioner where you desperately want somebody to seek help and they don't, um, 
to maintain the relationship um, and, and, you know, in, in fact, in yourself say it's OK, they're maybe not ready yet? Or, you know, you're absolutely right there, Sam, or they do take action, but they return. So I've yes. had lots of instances where I've had families who've sought my help. We've got the help in place. We've taken one of the, the parent who was at risk away with the children <laughs> and we put everything in place. But then the decision is made to return. And I think there's an area sometimes where a parent can start to feel a bit of shame that they've shared that with you and that you've gone to such an awful lot of, of work to help them. But then they've not been able to maintain that separation. Mm -hmm. And I think as practitioners, we have to be non-judgmental in that and just recognise that we have to continue with that support in whatever that support can be, even if it's just a cup of tea and a chat. How how are you? But that is there on our radar and we're watching for those signs with the children. I think that's really important. I think also if a child does make a big disclosure with regard to domestic abuse, then we need to involve those parents or guardians safely. So we need to be cautious when we involve, if we involve the parent in, in those discussions, because that child's safety is the top priority. And sometimes it is necessary to contact the child protection services or go straight to sort of social care without parental consent if we feel that that child is at real danger. Um, so it is very much dependent on what that disclosure is. The other really important bit, as with all safeguarding issues, is we have to document everything really carefully and, and really well and keep those detailed records of disclosures or observations or interactions related to that suspected abuse, because we may need those notes much later on, depending on outcomes of any social care investigations. So it's really important that we, we keep those notes and we don't just have those off the cuff conversations with a parent or a child, but we actually make sure it's all documented and build that picture, which is with all safeguarding is really, really important. And then providing resources. I know that in my times ahead, we had uh, posters on the backs of, uh, of, of our doors of toilets where parents would use with really clear instructions that will help for any parent who was facing those difficult uh, situations so that there was things there for them if they didn't want to talk but they needed help but they wanted to do that by themselves. So, you know, we kept those information on, on those and those doors we we also put them in leaflets or in in newsletters just small discreet but there for it to help parents if they needed that and i think it's really important as practitioners that we do you know keep ourselves educated on on the latest um you know things around abuse or the latest resources that are understand there or understand those dynamics of abuse to help us support our pupils in a better way, really, and plan that safety. What would you do? What is your safety plan? What's your plan if your parent does come in and requires you to, to help them suddenly and quickly? You know, schools are well placed to have that safety plan in, to have those discussions before it ever happens so that they know what their next step would be in those emergency situations. And I know, Sarah. I mean, I, I remember you. I mean, I, I'm I'm hoping you'll you'll feel okay to to, to share this today. I you, I remember you, um, describing um a situation where um you had a parent who had decided to actually remove herself and and family from a, from a very very disturbing situation mm -hmm. um and um he was was going to do that with without the other partner knowing and and the steps i wonder i, I mean do you do you feel okay to share that with us Abs yeah, absolutely. Well, we had a quite clear safety plan put in place and and that was uh, because the area that I worked in was a hotspot for domestic abuse. So we were very mindful of it. So there was one particular mother who I'd actually never met because interestingly, the children were brought to school by the father in the morning and picked up by the father. So we'd never actually met the mother which is concerning in itself. And if we ever asked, she'd had a baby, so she was at home, et cetera, and it was making life easier, dad bringing the children, bricking up the children. Then one morning, uh, this mum came to, uh, to school, asked to speak to me. She had the baby with her. 
she came into my office and disclosed dreadful domestic abuse, coercive behaviours from the husband, physical violence, uh, emotional abuse, just a real raft of domestic abuse. So we, <clears throat> excuse me, we quickly put the um, safety plan in place, uh, contacted the police, contacted relevant services, uh, and we managed to get mum into uh, safe housing very quickly. And in that, of course, we knew that at three o'clock, quarter past three, dad would come to pick up the children. So we had a plan in place with mum, with the police, that dad would come as normal. I would um, meet dad in the entrance hall after he'd gone to the classrooms to pick up the children. She wasn't there. I knew he'd come in. I primed all the teachers. We knew exactly what we were going to say. The teachers were to say, oh, uh, I think Mrs. Ronsey uh, had a meeting with mum. And that's all they had to say. So um, dad came into the front of school and uh, I met him and said, oh, and he said, where is my children? And I said, oh, I said, I think mum picked them up a little bit earlier, actually. She just came in earlier. She said that she had to take the children a bit earlier. So she picked them up about quarter to three. I did not know. I said, well, that's exactly what happened. So he left at that particular point. And of course, the police then visited dad. And about half an hour later at the home, because they knew he would be going home at that particular point. Mum, <coughs> excuse me, went into uh, safe accommodation, um, but she did return uh, two days later. Um, she just couldn't deal with the safe place. She found it. she didn't feel safe in the safe place, interestingly. And that was something that we had to deal with at that time. But we put a plan in place where we did meet mum. We spoke with dad and said, mum must bring the children to school. It's important we see mum. It's important we see you. Um, and then that was passed on. And social care did pick that up at that particular point. And the children were put into a children in need plan and support did go in place. And dad had some work. But that just shows you that we had to have that safety plan in place. We knew what we were doing. We knew how to deal with that situation at that particular time. And it was important that my staff had the confidence in me to deal with that situation. They weren't placed in any danger having to deal with the dad. So interesting that we have those things in place, really. Mm. I think going on to more of the sort of signs of what we have to do is we have to have self-care because I think as practitioners when I think about my staff and, and think about ourselves dealing with those situations we have to be aware that that is emotionally draining so there's really really important that we practice the self-care and we seek support for ourselves when we're having to deal with situations where we're dealing with children or families that are victims of, of domestic abuse. You know, we're not alone in this and there are resources available as well for staff. So I think that's really important that we have those uh, systems in place as well. Yeah, and it's also important to recognise that statistically, you will be working with a colleague experiencing domestic abuse. You know, you will be around people um, mm -hmm. who will be experiencing domestic abuse in some shape or form, and they may be concealing that very, very well. Um, but we have a duty. We have a duty of care, and, and you know, not only to the families that we work with and the, and the children that we work with, but we also have that duty of care that extends to those that we work with. Yeah, and I think it's really important to note that domestic abuse isn't confined to people in poverty or people of certain, um, you know, types of, of, you know, hierarchy in the social norms. It's not. It can happen to anybody. It is regardless of income, of prosperity, of financial security, of the homes. It can happen to anybody. And I think that is really important. Everybody have that in the forefront of your of your minds. So it's irrelevant of what type of school you're teaching, where that school is. They there will be people. There are potentially people in your staff, and there are certainly potential parents, irrespective of the socioeconomic background. Really, yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I would add uh, to um, this really kind of relates to. Um, I sort of think wider message 
that I always give when I'm talking to people about safeguarding, and that is just to be mindful that sometimes things can present as something completely different, but they can actually all be connected with domestic abuse. So um, I can give you a, a, an example where this actually occurred um, with me in practice. I was uh, contacted um, by another member of staff and, and the, the, the school I was working in also had a children's centre attached and um, uh, there was a, a young child who was already in school um, but there was a, a, a real attendance issue and the child hadn't attended and they tried to call home and they'd had this very, very strange conversation with mum. Uh, now, mum never dropped uh, the, the child off at school. Uh, mum had, had, had just had another baby, um, but she'd never uh, attended to, uh, the school at all. It was always dad who had, had brought the child to school, but the child hadn't attended the school. And... Uh, so it was a real attendance issue. This this is what it was all sort of wrapped up. But, you know, that was what the difficulty was. And we needed to, you know, I was told, can we get to the bottom of these attendance issues? And so I was asked to go and do a visit. But because I'd been told there was this very odd conversation, um, I didn't do the visit alone. Um, I took another member of staff with me and we went and visited mum at the home. As soon as... Um, I met mum, I knew there was a significant difficulty. Mum presented, um, she was very, very, um, her mood was very flat. It was very low. She was speaking in a, a very sort of almost like a, a, a monotone kind of fatalistic almost kind of manner, um, expressionless, um, she was uh, in another room. Uh, the baby was in a different room. The child was in another room. They went, you know, they went together. She couldn't offer any explanation why the child hadn't gone to school. Um, and she then sort of broke down and, and said that she didn't see any point to anything anymore. And I really realised this, 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 this poor, poor mum was really not well and um i was very very concerned um i really had not only concerns about her mental health i had concerns about the possibilities that might happen if i left the house i didn't want to leave this mum on her own mm -hmm. and so i i rang back to base I discussed it with uh, the other uh, the other deputy DSLs, and uh, I decided to um, contact social care. Unfortunately, when I contacted social care, um, I could only speak to a duty social worker. There wasn't a social worker available to come out, and I was asked to maintain and stay at the house. Um, and um, Having gone through a, quite a detailed conversation, they wanted to speak with the community psychiatric team. Uh, unfortunately, the community psychiatric team uh, refused to attend because mum hadn't been seen and reviewed by her GP for a referral. Um, I, I contacted the GP's practice and the GP practice um had you know wouldn't speak to me and um, wouldn't give me any information and I, I asked if the GP could attend and I was told no there was no home visits available um so I was kind of caught up in this uh kind of multi-agency nobody wanting yeah. to, to 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 sort of pick, pick this up but I was in a position where I just didn't want to leave the house um, Dad was contacted um, and um, I explained to him that I, I, I felt mum was very, very unwell. Um, Dad was very, very angry about being contacted at work. Um, he didn't want to leave work. Um, so it was a very difficult phone call to say to him he needed to come home and he needed to come home, you know, as soon mm. as possible. Um, so this this kind of sort of maintained, you know, the situation for, you know, all day. Dad eventually did arrive home absolutely furious that he'd had to leave work. It wasn't supportive of mum. Mum seemed terrified. Um, 
and eventually um, uh, it transpired that mum hadn't actually left the house um, in a in a very long time. Uh, she'd had a home birth um, and uh, she really wasn't on the radar of, of, of anybody's services. Um, through many, many phone calls back and forward with the with social care, we eventually did manage in the evening to get um, the, a, a GP to visit who immediately contacted the community psychiatric team who mm. then came out. Um, but it was a, 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 a very, very difficult day um, dealing with what I would say was a, an extremely serious incident with somebody who was extremely poorly, but with someone who was quite clearly experiencing a very, very high level of coercive control. Um, so it, it actually became um, a very, very different thing than the initial we're not happy with this child's attendance. Can you go out and have a word with mum? So I guess I'm I'm kind of throwing that example in the pot here in that um, I know we always give the message, you know, be aware, be vigilant, but also just be aware that they are, you know, the, the initial concern that you might have may actually be something very, very different. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be, uh, you know, a, a report from the police, does it, to make that. It no. can just have lots and lots. So it's about always having that vigilance of signs, isn't it? And delving a bit deeper, being a bit of a detective, thinking about what's going on really here. You know, and I do think it's really important, Sam, to remember that, you know, victims of domestic violence do need a lot of support to get through this. And whilst they're going through that, and getting maybe that strength to leave or to move away from that awful situation is can be absolutely traumatic and awful. You know, there is amazing resilience that builds up, though, between, you know, with amongst these people who've uh, have been through these awful situations. And we have to shine that torch at the end of a tunnel, really, because life can get so much better after. Uh, you know, I've had lots and lots of experiences of families where, Life has blossomed beyond um, beyond awful situations and people have grown and developed and made lives on themselves that they never thought possible. So that resilience is massively important. And there is lots and lots of help out there for families uh, and lots of help to, to help people to, to get that better life and, and build that resilience through. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... It is about just keeping these key things in, in you know, as a practitioner, just be aware um, there will, you know, this will be happening around you. It will be affecting men. It will be affecting women. Perpetrators will be men. Perpetrators will be women. Yeah. Um, you know, just, you know, just keep keep that on the radar, if you like. Um, and um, that even though it can be frustrating at times, um, our role is to support somebody to have the confidence, even though you know that possibly for a, a, a period of time, things may seem very, very difficult once action's taken. There is that, as you described, that that kind of shining torch, that light to say, you know, things might become more difficult for a while, but do you know what? Things will improve. Mm. And there is lots of support out there. And I think really uh, the note I'd like to finish on is just to remind people that, um, you know, obviously there is, there is help in schools. Um, there's also a lot of help um, that uh, can be found both to support professionals, but also to support anybody who's listening today who might be affected um, by this. There is the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. I'll just give you the number. It's 0808 2000 247. There's information on the um, NHS sites. If you just Google NHS Domestic Abuse, 
um, it will bring up um, a, a whole menu of um, organisations um, that that can support people. Um, there's also the .gov, the 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 uh, .gov .uk domestic abuse how to get help. Um, that includes um, giving instructions on how you can get help if you're in a situation and you can't speak. So if you're trying to perhaps telephone the police mm -hmm. to get help, but you can't talk, it will actually tell you how you can do that. And there's lots um, of other support in the community of a similar vein where there are key phrases um, that you can just go in um, and uh, say to a member of staff this key phrase and they will actually know that you need help. So you're not having to go and actually disclose anything. So please do um, uh, have a look at the, the .gov site. There's a, a lot of information on there.